Indonesian town that's been targeted by Daesh. We have a special report from Ben Gardan, a few kilometers away from the Libyan border. Also on today's program, as the Zika virus continues to spread around the world, just how worried should we be? Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Tunisia is seen as the success story of the Arab Spring. It was the first country where people took to the streets in 2011, asking for the resignation of their longtime leader, Zain al Abidin bin Ali. Five years on, as Syria, Yemen and Libya have descended into chaos, and as Egypt's elected government was toppled by a second revolution, Tunisia has turned into a representative democracy. But it's still facing many challenges. Poverty, corruption and terrorism. Daesh has carried out many attacks on Tunisian soil. It even tried to take control of the town of Ben Gardan, a few kilometers away from the Libyan border. One of our teams has just come back from Ben Gardan. And on today's Newsmakers, we visit this town where the revolution has not delivered on its promises. A town on the fringe of the Tunisian state. People here have survived by smuggling for as long as anyone can remember. Most of the Tunisian fighters who joined Daesh come from this town. And the group has tried to make it one of its strongholds. The day Sarah died, I wasn't at home. She peeked under the door and saw boots coming toward the house. She thought, it's the army, I should let them in the house. They're here to protect us. But when she opened the door, the terrorists kicked her and the rest of the family out of the house. As she started running, my daughter was shot in the crossfire. She died the next morning. Bengardan is a town in Tunisia with 80,000 inhabitants. It's about 30 kilometers from the Libyan border. Back in March, it was the scene of the worst Daesh attack on Tunisian soil so far. 65 people were killed, including seven civilians, when the terror group tried to take over. Mabruk's daughter was one of them. I kept all her stuff so I can remember her. I kept her books, her awards, her drawing, everything is here. Including her last drawing that she never finished. Sara was one of Mabruk's eight children, a smart 16-year-old who wanted to be an architect to help build her country. Sara was buried alongside the other victims of the attack in this part of the cemetery that the town council dedicated to them. Every Friday, Mabruk comes here to mourn his daughter. But he's convinced she didn't die in vain. I am proud that my daughter died for this country. This is something that elevates me. It's a crown I wear on my head. I am proud she's a martyr. As the Quran says, the spirit of the martyrs remains alive, they don't die. They're always alive in this life and here in the year after. Daesh failed to make Bangardan one of its strongholds, to extend its so-called caliphate to Tunisia. But the town still remains very much a part of the group's terror network. Tunisia is the largest recruiting ground for Daesh. According to various studies, between 6,000 and 8,000 of its citizens have joined the terror group. They're fighting in Syria, Iraq and the neighboring Libya. According to the UN, 1,500 Tunisians are in Libya and up to 15% of them are from Ben Gardan. This man agreed to talk to us, provided we wouldn't reveal his identity. His older brother joined Daesh but was caught. 
يعني في فيفري 2016 يعني مؤخرا. In February, I was informed that my brother was detained by the Libyan security forces. قبل فرقة قوة الردع. A month later, a video of him confirming he was in a Libyan prison was released. المعلومة اللي هو موجود في ليبيا في السجن. Libya has arrested many Tunisians and released videos of them admitting to have fought alongside the group, blaming Tunisia for not doing enough to stop them. In 2011, after the revolution deposed President Zain al Abidin bin Ali, the new government granted amnesty to some groups that were previously banned. Among them, Ansar al Sharia an organization that soon started to carry out attacks and encourage Tunisians to fight in Syria. The government then launched a major crackdown, targeting anyone suspected of being linked to the organization. But according to our source, they went too far. The reason there is terrorism in Tunisia is because of the oppression by the security forces and the law. If someone else received the treatment that I got from the state, he would have joined Daesh. That feeling of injustice leads some people to seek revenge. But for other young Tunisians, it's the lack of hope for the future that pushes them into the hands of Daesh with promises of a better life in the hereafter. Many young people here face unemployment and they were tempted by the work and money Daesh can offer them. Also, some youth then think they'll find enlightenment if they go fight in Syria. And with the absence of moderate religious institutions, young people don't get the right knowledge. Instead, they learn from TV and the internet. This is how they fall into extremist propaganda. But if they're able to resist the propaganda, they still need to make a living. And for many who refuse to fight for Daesh, there's only one way to survive, smuggling. Now I'm putting the barrels from my house into the car and I'm heading to Libya. I hope to reach my destination as long as the military does not stop me and set my car on fire. Almost half of Tunisia's economy is based on the black market. And Bangardan is no exception. We built Bangardan through smuggling. My grandfather taught me smuggling. When people were learning at school, I was learning how to smuggle. Smugglers use this sandy desert track to take weapons, people, and other goods to and from Libya, which is a couple of kilometers ahead. And while it's a source of income, it also has its dangers. We convinced one smuggler to shoot some pictures for us. The trench we can see here prevents cars from crossing from Tunisia into Libya. So that's how they trade their goods. Everything and everyone goes through the border, including weapons, even Daesh fighters. The army tries to monitor this road, but according to Faisal, smugglers see more than the army does. The first ones to report the terrorists' cars are the smugglers. Smugglers are always on the border. And when they see strange things, they report it. Smugglers just want to make a living of 25 to 30 dollars. They don't want bad things to happen on the border. It will make us lose our jobs. Most of the goods smuggled across the border can be found in Bengardan's so-called Libyan market. Everything from 3D TVs to kitchenware. And there's no tax. The oil smuggled in by Faisal can be found in some of the hundreds of makeshift petrol stations across the town. Miloud runs one of them. Not a preferred career choice for someone who used to work in Turkey as a translator. But here, he doesn't have any other options. If the government gives us an alternative, brings in manufacturers, we would stop this business and stop selling fuel. It's not good for my health anymore. Maloud is also involved in one of the other illegal businesses in Bangardan, money changing. 
In these blue wooden booths, the so-called money men send cash outside the country, informally. A way for the smugglers to pay for the goods they bought overseas. But it can also be used for other illegal transactions, including terrorist activities, which remains the biggest threat to this town, where most people complain they have been forgotten by the state. The party that led the country after the 2011 revolution was Anava, more than 500 kilometers away from Bengardan, at their headquarters, they admitted that the border town had been neglected for decades. Rashid Ghannoushi is the head of the party that won the first Tunisian election. After the revolution in 2011, it ran Tunisia until 2013 and tried to solve the many problems that led to the revolution, mainly unemployment, corruption and poverty. Ghanoushi believes that the majority of Bengardan's people still believe in the state. It turned out that the majority of Daesh attackers were from Bengardan, but during the attack their families were the ones who led the security forces and the police to their children who were missing. But critics say that the Anatha movement ignored the rise of Daesh in the country, as the situation in neighbouring Libya deteriorated. For Ghanoushi, fighting against poverty is one of the answers to fighting Daesh in Bengardan. We're expecting municipal and local elections next year, so the area can be responsible for its own development. Now all the areas are focused on Tunis and rely on the capital, but we're hoping that each region gets its own representatives who are responsible for development. But that might be too little, too late. Tunisia and Libya share a 560 kilometer border, and with Daesh proliferating on the other side of the frontier, the security threat for Tunisia is not limited to one town. Badr Jaloul's think tank focuses on Daesh's military and recruitment strategy. The southern part of Tunisia is a gold mine for terrorists, preachers, and recruiters. The biggest threat comes from the border with Libya, where there is no state and which can be seen as a massive ground for terrorist training camps. That's why we have to be vigilant in Bengarden and in the rest of southern Tunisia. It's the unity of the Middle East's youngest democracy that's at stake. And if the government doesn't find a way to address the concerns of the people of Bengarden and southern Tunisia, it might lose it altogether. Tunisia. Mohsin and Naimi was the producer of that film and joins me here in the studio. Uh, Mohsin, it, looking at that film, you were there, you were on the ground. People have been writing about this. You have Tunisia, which is a success story of, of the Arab Spring, the freest democracy in the Arab world. Yet, you have this paradox. You have in some parts of this country, it's a Daesh factory. Massive numbers of people, young people particularly, going and joining Daesh. Were you any closer, in a personal and professional sense, to understanding or learning why? Well, it's true. I mean, uh, in Tunisia, uh, you have the first youngest uh the first and the youngest democracy in the uh, in Middle East, and it didn't, the country didn't fall in, into, into chaos. Uh, however, you have the biggest uh, fighters for Daesh are coming from, uh, from Tunisia. People are saying between 3,000, that's the official figure, mm -hmm. 8,000 is one of the uh, other extreme. Reasonably, we can speak about like 6,000 to 8,000 uh, people, and uh, many of them are coming from Tunis and also from Ben Garden. Mm -hmm. So Ben Garden, is also like, uh, like part of Tunisia where corruption, where poverty wasn't tackled by the, by the revolution. And, and also you can add that uh, Ben Gardan is like more than 500 kilometers from central power in, mm. uh, in Tunis. It's very close to Libya. The country, the, this place was, was living uh, with uh, the business of smuggling for the past decades. There is no proper um, investment People say there's actually a, a very big underinvestment in the southern part of Tunisia and in particular in, uh, in Ben Garden. So all these elements adding together makes like, you know, uh, people from Ben Garden going more 
to, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to join Daesh, and especially because the border is very porous. We're talking about like, you know, 30% of the border, which is controlled. The rest is not really. You mentioned a low estimate of 3,000 and a high estimate of 8,000. Massive difference between the two. Why is there such a discrepancy and why, why is there no clarity on the numbers? There are many reasons, actually. Uh, most of the people uh, who disappear, first of all, they don't leave a note. So basically, we don't know if they disappear or if they went for, uh, for economical, um, uh, economical migration to Europe or some other places. Uh, and also, one part which I understand when I was in Ben Garden is many of the family, they don't report about uh, these disappearances. And why they don't report? Because they don't want to be into the police uh, radar. They don't want to feel the harassment from the authorities because as soon as you have like someone who went to uh, or, or who fled to uh, to Syria or Iraq or Libya, then you have like you know a lot of uh, other, uh, people from from the government intelligence coming to you, harassing your family, asking questions, checking everything, uh, and also interrogating other people. And that's also one point which is very important. Many people get arrested even if they have nothing to do with that. We have this this case in uh, in uh, in the reportage, and also the, the the last reason also that's important to uh, to mention is that these people they don't want to re report about their son or daughter who left just because in case of they came back, in case right. of what they're gonna do, how they're gonna judge them. So they, they, they just like try to make it like very silent and make sure no one knows. You've seen a lot of war, of conflict, of the Middle East, of the story post 2011. How challenging was this for you going to Ben Gardan? And tell me about some of the, the difficulties in, in telling this story. Benghazi is an easy place. Uh, it's not a war zone, but it's not an easy place because people are very hostile, very aggressive. They see uh, any newcomers as, um, as a threat, as a someone spying on them, as someone going to make something bad about them. So they're very like, you know, uh, suspicious about anyone coming. And we're not exception, especially when you're carrying a camera and a team. So, so that's, that's, that's something that, that I felt like, you know, uh, very strong in Ben Garden. And also it's a, it's a medium city, 80,000 people. So we, we see you like, you know, very, off, very quickly. The point is when we've been filming, um, we get like, you know, uh, harassed by some people who, who told us not to film. We just left, but after that, we learned that there were like four cars chasing us in the whole city. Hmm. Uh, and they just wanted to take our camera and God knows what else. So we, we've been told to hide our car in a, in a, in a parking, uh, to stay calm for a few hours, and that's what we did. One of the car finally find us, and it's been kind of like intensive, like, you know, um, discussion, if you would say discussion, but it was not a fight, but like very serious. And we managed after a couple of minutes of talking, explaining when I explain what we're doing, what's, the, what's our intention, etc. then people says, okay, we trust you, but we have an eye on you. Right. And that was very, uh, I mean, that was kind of uh, like, you know, not really nice to hear. But interestingly, two days after, uh, or three days after, we, uh, we get like, you know, a different reaction from the people. They were very uh, friendly, uh, very welcoming. Uh, anytime we do interview, people were, like, were stopping to say, can I be interviewed? Can I say something on, uh, on the camera as well? Mm -hmm. and, and they were like very helpful at the end. So when we left the city, they were all, all telling us like, oh, you're already leaving. So this is like, you know, this kind of situation right. when you break the ice and mm -hmm. then you manage to make the story. Okay. It's been great to get this deeper insight from you, Mohsin. Thanks so much. Thank you. The early results of a high-profile study on the Zika virus have confirmed a direct causal link between the infection in pregnant women and the birth defect microcephaly. The study was commissioned by Brazil's health ministry after the Zika outbreak started in the country last year. Zika has now spread to dozens of countries, but it's not grabbing the headlines as it did earlier in the year when the World Health Organization declared it an international public health emergency. So was the risk overblown? Or should we still be worried? Natalie Pohernan takes a look. We've known about the Zika virus for decades. 
Most people who contract the mosquito-borne disease don't even realize they have it. But the rapid spread of the virus in Brazil raised concerns after scientists found a link between the infection and brain damage known as microcephaly. And then cases of sexual transmissions were observed. The more we learn about Zika, the more worry we get about it. I, I must say that once again, uh, the risk profile of Zika has changed over the years. Ahead of the Rio Games, there was a growing panic about Zika. Athletes dropped out, tourists were warned to stay away, and women were told it could harm pregnancies. The World Health Organization says there have been no cases linked to the Games. So was the fear unfounded? The virus can now be found across the globe. The most recent infections are in Southeast Asia. For all of the fear about the pandemic, the WHO advice is quite straightforward. Only one in four people infected will develop symptoms. And in most cases, the disease is usually mild and doesn't need any treatment. Despite that, it is still considered an international public health emergency. SARS was the first major virus outbreak of the 21st century. It moved quickly beyond China, where it was first discovered, to become a worldwide problem. It became the test case for how to investigate, contain and inform the public about pandemics. Swine flu, bird flu, MERS and Ebola have all followed. Packed cities and ease of travel helped to shape these modern viruses, which didn't stop at borders. And because they've become international problems, the public health messages have had to go global as well. But does that prescription create fear and not always knowledge about the real threat of pandemics? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Joining me now from London is virologist Dr. Rob Lamkin-Williams. Thanks so much for joining us. Now, we now know with a fair amount of certainty that Zika causes microcephaly. How important is it that we know? It's not with just a fair amount of certainty. We do know it causes mm -hmm. it. We have lots of evidence to demonstrate that this virus does cause microcephaly. It is the causal factor, and we know it's got major consequences in pregnant women. So it's not where we were six months ago, where we were debating if it was the cause, was there something else going on here? We are very confident now that it is actually the cause. Now, there's some interesting uh, choice quotations from the Lancet Infectious Diseases journal the researchers wrote that you know that because of the striking association we should prepare for the epidemic of microcephaly to expand to all countries with current local zika virus transmission and to those countries where transmission of the virus is likely to spread um, i'm not a doctor i'm not a scientist that sounds very alarming to me does it sound as alarming to you um, I think it's, it's cautionary. Um, you know, at the end of the day, this virus um, is transmitted via mosquitoes. So in countries which have those mosquitoes, which includes most of Northern America, lots of Southern Europe, then there is a real risk, an absolutely major risk, in fact, that we are going to see a much bigger problem with this virus spreading because it is spread from mosquitoes to humans. It's actually very difficult for the virus to spread from human to human. It really only happens um, from human to human by somebody who's been infected and then sexually transmits it from human to human. So that's why people travel into at-risk areas such as Brazil is the obvious example at the moment. It, it is a risk if a male or a female gets infected, then they can actually, particularly males, can actually pass it on to females sexually. But most people won't even know they've been infected because they will barely even notice the disease. It's pregnant women where we have the problem because we have the birth defects that actually develop due to the infection. Mm -hmm. Are you confident that globally we're going to be able to put a lid on this? Um, I think it's too early to say. Um, there's been some research done recently. In some ways, it's encouraging that herd immunity, in other words, there are so many people who become infected that the virus does spread much more slowly can occur um, and it's possible and there's been some research recently that says 
it will almost burn itself out because so many people will become so infected um, and without any real symptoms that in about three to five years, maybe it's not going to be a problem. There's another school of thought that says we're going to have a problem for years to come. So I think we're at too early a stage at the moment to actually be really confident about this. I think we should not be worried as such, but at the same time we shouldn't be, you know, blasé about it. We should understand that people do need to take precautions mm -hmm. and certainly go into areas where there is Zika infected mosquitoes, such as Brazil, such as a lot of other countries as well. Then people need to be cautious about whether or not they're exposing themselves to it. Okay, Dr. Rob Lamkin Williams, unfortunately uh, we are out of time, but I've learned a lot from you. Thank you very much. On today's Newsmakers, we took you to the Tunisian town of Ben Gardan, a few kilometers from the Libyan border. A town that was targeted by Daesh just a few months ago and where many of the youth have joined the terror group. Our producer who made the film there told us that poverty and corruption is endemic. People feel let down by the government, which has not delivered on the promises of the revolution of five years ago. Unless the government provides better opportunities for these young people, even more may turn to Daesh, which represents a grave threat to the future of Tunisia. You've been watching this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.